Early in my ministry days, there was a sweet elderly lady in our congregation, and I'll just call her Mabel. Mabel used to testify that she was saved when she was eight, baptized when she was 14, and had obediently been walking with Jesus ever since. She called me one day, I'm new in town, I'm her new pastor, and said, when you have a minute, could you stop by? I need some prayer. I said, certainly. And she said, uh, I'm not sleeping well, and I have some headaches that nothing can touch, and the joy of the Lord that I once knew is gone. So when I got to her home, I uh, asked her a question before we prayed. I said, Mabel, is there anything in your heart that might prevent Jesus from answering this prayer? She was slightly offended as she reminded me that she was saved when she was eight, baptized when she was 14, and had been walking faithfully with Jesus ever since, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let it go. So I asked her the same question in another way. I said, Mabel, is there any bitterness in your heart? Anyone that you've not been able to forgive? With that, she sat up straight in her chair and her lips got real tight as she told me this sad, sad story of something that had happened in the church three years earlier at a fellowship dinner. See, they had just remodeled the church kitchen, and the women of the Church of God had raised money for new silverware, but the silverware was not in yet. And so various ladies were asked to each bring a tray of their own silverware for this love feast. Well, one of Ruth's jobs, and Ruth, by the way, was Mabel's neighbor, and Ruth had nicer everything because her husband made more money. Ruth even had nicer silverware. And so, as they were coming through the line, one of Ruth's jobs behind the scenes was to make sure that there was always fresh food out on line, moving the dishes back as they emptied. And she was also moving these trays of silverware out one at a time because with everybody bringing their silverware and all these different patterns, they knew they were going to have to sort it out later, so one tray at a time as needed. As Mabel's coming through the line to get her food, at least in her mind, I mean, she saw that her tray was next. But as she approached the silverware, in her mind, Ruth set Mabel's older silverware aside and pushed her newer, nicer silverware out instead. To Mabel, it was like rubbing it in her nose, saying, look, at, I have nicer silverware than you do. Well, when the love feast was over, Mabel gave Ruth a piece of her mind, and unfortunately, there were two other women there. One took Mabel's side, one took Ruth's side. And when it was over, Ruth and her husband left the church and never returned. And these two women, who not only both professed to be followers of Christ and lived on opposite ends of the same street, these two women now for three years had not spoken to each other. Sounds pretty childish, doesn't it? How many of you think it sounds childish? <laughs> I used to think that until the Holy Spirit reminded me one day that my issue that was pretty important to me was just as childish as that silverware issue. When she finished, I said, Mabel, I think I know why you're not sleeping, and I might know about these headaches, and for sure I know what happened to your joy, and it's not going to do us any good to pray about any of this until you forgive your neighbor. I wonder who's the silverware person in your life. Pastor Mike has been preaching a powerful series called The Comeback. For every setback, there's what? And this is the last in that series, so let's remember that with Jesus, there's always a comeback. And today I want to talk about the setback that comes through conflict and the comeback that often takes forgiveness and reconciliation. If you have a Bible, please turn quickly with me to the New Testament book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, the scriptures will be on the screen as well, Colossians 3, 
and verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. And by the way, the baptisms last weekend present that image that we've been raised with Christ to walk in newness of life, dead to our past, to our old sinful ways, and raised up to walk in newness of life. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died... And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then there's a long list of sins that would make a sermon series in itself. Verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and what? Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Father, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say to each one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. From the notes, point one. Because you and I are loved and have been forgiven, we must love and forgive one another. That's pretty basic theology, isn't it? We've been loved, he's forgiven us, and now he says, I want you to love and forgive the other people in your world. But at point two, we have a problem. Although we're called to love and forgive one another, too often we don't. In my 40-plus years of pastoral counseling, I know that bitterness and unforgiveness is something that probably every person here this morning at one time or another has struggled with. And I also know from my own life that forgiveness is hard work. Perhaps for you, it's your spouse. Maybe something happened on the way into church today. Or 10 years ago that you've still not let go of. Or a former spouse. Or maybe it's one of your kids or all of your kids that you've not been able to forgive. Or your in-laws. Maybe it's your own father or stepfather. Or maybe it's that boss who fired you or at least passed you over when it was time for promotion. And sometimes the pain goes even deeper. It may be that stranger who molested you or your child. Sometimes it happens in the church. Our silverware issues are racial. God help us. Or maybe one of your friends left the church and like Ruth and Mabel, two people who used to be friends are now estranged. Or maybe a pastor that something he said in his sermon rubbed you the wrong way or disappointed you in some way, and you left the church without ever trying to make it right, and you're hoping that someday if you both make it to heaven, you'll live on opposite sides so you'll never have to see each other again. We're talking about the setbacks that come through conflict and the comeback that often takes forgiveness and reconciliation. Point three from my personal pastoral counseling and from this little booklet by Dr. Neil Anderson who wrote The Bondage Breaker. I want to talk about the three, maybe for me, the most common protests or reasons why we find it difficult to forgive. Mabel's first protest was this. Ruth hurt me. So Ruth needs to come and apologize to me before I'll ever even think about forgiving her. We're waiting for that other person to come crawling on their knees to say, I'm sorry for what I said, I'm sorry for what I did, and then we'll think about forgiving them. But I told Mabel that, I said, Ruth may die before she ever comes to apologize. 
And in the meantime, you, Mabel, you are the one who called for prayer. You are the one who's hurting. So here's a principle. I don't forgive others for their sake. I forgive them for my own sake. Nelson Mandela said it this way, resentment is like drinking poison, hoping it will kill your enemy. (laughs) Because the bitterness in my own heart is what's destroying me. And then when speaking with Mabel, I added this. I said, by now, you owe Ruth an apology. She may have jacked with your silverware, at least in your mind she did, But we're called to love one another. And for the past three years, you've not loved your neighbor as yourself. Whose sin is greater? I didn't quite say that to her. But I said, you owe her an apology because for the last three years, you've rejected her. You've not spoken to her. In fact, they lived on opposite ends of the street. But the closest route to town For Mabel was to drive by Ruth's house. For three years, she would back out of her driveway and go the other way, take a longer way to town so she wouldn't even have to drive by her enemy's house. Second objection at second asterisk. You know, I'm just not feeling it. I don't feel like forgiving you. And as you see on the screen, forgiveness has nothing to do with my feelings, but everything to do with my Obedience to God's word. You know, when Jesus went to the cross to die for the forgiveness of my sins, I don't think he was feeling so good about that. But he did it anyway. Because forgiveness is not about feelings, but it's about the fact of obedience. And since he commands me to forgive, it's not only something that I'm able to do, but it's something that I must do. Third objection, third asterisk. Pastor, you have no idea how deeply that person hurt me. You don't know how much I've suffered because of what they said or did to me. You're right, I I don't know. But Jesus does. And here are two things that are true and that other person has hurt me. First of all, what they did to me may cause me to suffer some consequence for a long time, maybe even for the rest of my life. Recently, when we were in Zimbabwe, uh, my wife had an opportunity to minister to 200 women who all had AIDS. And they were angry because of a boyfriend or a husband that sinned and gave them what was now killing them. And these two women were suffering. They would suffer for the rest of their lives. And and my wife shared with them about 200 women out under a tree Some were seated on the ground, some standing. A little outdoor sanctuary that nobody had planned on being a sanctuary until this group gathered. And my wife shared with him, you you have to make a choice. You're going to live with the consequences one way or another, but you can either live with those consequences plus the additional bitterness in your hearts, or you can live with the freedom Song talked about setting the the prisoner that's set free as me. You can be set free from your anger and bitterness if you'll come to Jesus and let him help you. But you need to forgive them. 200 women all came to makeshift little altars made out of logs. And some on their knees, some on their faces, 200 women forgave those men who in essence were killing them. The second thing that's true, and I've tried this one, you know, because of those consequences, because of what I've suffered, I can't let them off my hook. You know, 
I need to give them the silent treatment. I need them to see my mad face so they'll know how much they hurt me and maybe they'll come crawling on their hands and knees and tell me they're sorry. I need to keep that. I can't let them off my hook. But here's a biblical truth. If I will let them off my hook, God will put them on his hook. That's what the Bible says, Romans 12, 19. Do not take revenge, my friends, but God says, leave room for my wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So when I keep that person on my hook, and then I'm wondering, God, why aren't you doing anything about it? I'm standing in his way. I'm trying to play God in their life. And God's probably just saying, so how's that working out for you? See, if I will let them off my hook, my loving Heavenly Father will put them on his hook. And trust me, he is far wiser than I am, and he knows how to deal with my enemy in ways that may be more loving than I'm trying, ways that may be more convincing or whatever, because God knows. So if I will do what God tells me to do, forgive, God will do what he has promised to do, and that's to repay. Point four, we discover what life is like when I choose not to forgive. First of all, my unwillingness to forgive leads to a broken relationship with God. So pretty serious words here in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. God says, if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. God says, you want forgiveness? Then you must forgive. As the notes continue... Obviously, my unwillingness to forgive leads to a broken relationship with them, those people <laughs> that maybe were once my neighbors, my friends. And now the relationship is broken with those people that God says I'm supposed to love. Next asterisk. Every time I let the sun go down on my anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness, I give the devil a foothold. I give the devil an opportunity to begin working in my life and situation. You say, really? Well, God's word, not mine. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. God says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Is the devil at work in your marriage, in your home? In your own heart, it just may be that you open the door to him and let him march right in and begin working in your situation. That's what God's word says. And once you've given the devil a foothold, he will continue his work of building a stronghold in your home, in your heart, in your own, your marriage, whatever it might be. Point five, in so many words, says that my unforgiveness destroys my witness. Jesus said it this way in John 13, a new command I give you, love one another. By this, all men and women and children will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So it's not our awesome worship that attracts people. It's not even Pastor Mike's powerful preaching. It's our love. The kind of love, by the way, that we often preach but don't always practice. You know, in that small community where Mabel and Ruth lived, Mabel's husband was with Jesus by the time I showed up. But both of those men had been prominent in that community of about 6,000 people. And so the whole town knew how a love feast turned in 
to fight. And so uh, I was in the coffee shop early on, and uh, not only did I need a cup of coffee, but I thought maybe I can meet some new people in town and invite them to church, right? And so the waitress is pouring up the coffee, and so I've not ever seen you in here before. You must be new in town. And I said, yes, and I'm the pastor, and I named the church. And, you know, everything's going to change now because I've arrived, right? And she stops about mid-pour. <laughs> and small coffee shop, I wasn't talking that loud, but everybody's looking at the stranger. And it's like, oh, that church. And I realized right away <laughs> that the witness that once went forth from that church at one time was the strongest church in that community died because of silverware trays. So what conflict has set you back? Are you ready to forgive and come back into the relationship that Jesus calls us to have with him? If you are, there's a prayer that uh, with the help of Dr. Neil Anderson and the bondage breaker, uh, and I've modified this a little bit so I wouldn't break any um, copyright laws. But here's the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, and for the silverware ladies, today I choose to forgive Ruth for jacking with my silverware. Now the person's name you put in there may have offended you in, in a way that's far more serious, and I don't want to make light of that. And some of you, at least it was true for me, I had to pray this prayer more than a few times, inserting different names and different offenses. Today I choose to forgive that person and then name what they did. I release that person from my desire to seek revenge and I'm turning that person over to you. Lord, I ask you to forgive me for the bitterness for my bitterness toward that person. And Satan, in the name of Jesus, my Lord, I take back the ground I surrendered to you through my unforgiving spirit. Holy Spirit, please come and heal my heart and give me the courage and the opportunity to be reconciled to that person. I also ask you to bless that person because we're to bless even our enemies. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Will you consider that prayer? I have one more story. At another place, another time in ministry, uh, a woman came into my office to see me. I'll just call her Sarah. And she was mad enough to spit nails. Her bum husband, and I can't use the words she used to describe him because we're in church, but... He couldn't hold a job. She was a supervisor where she worked, and he had maxed out all of her credit cards. He had done a lot of other things that really ticked her off, but recently she had come home early from work one day and found him in bed, their bed, with another woman. And as she poured out her anger, and I listened, and we prayed, and spent quite a bit of time with her, and at the end she said, I just don't know what to do next. And I said, Sarah, um, you're not going to want to hear this, but one of the things that God wants you to do next is forgive him. And she said, I'll go to my grave before I forgive him. I said, then you will go to your grave with the anger and the bitterness in your heart that you're just demonstrating today. So I convinced her to pray this prayer. So she said, today I choose, and don't pray, Lord, help me. He's already helped you. He's given you the helper. It's a choice now. Lord, I choose to forgive my husband for, and then her list of offenses was longer than a Minnesota winter. <laughs> and she prayed that prayer without any emotion, and when she got all through, she said, there. I prayed it. I prayed it up here. 
but I'm not feeling it down here. I said, that's okay, because it's not about your feelings. It's about a fact of your obedience. She said, well, I'm not feeling it. And I said, Sarah, here's what I want you to do. For the next, however long it takes, I want you every morning to pray this prayer. And let's see what Jesus might do. Six months later, it's a small congregation, a few hundred people, and so my wife and I are always at the back doors de-greeting, and some people bolt for the other doors, but we're always just de-greeting as people are going through, and Sarah was in the line. <laughs> and there was another sweet elderly lady uh, talking with her. I, you know, I was 30 years old at the time, so sweet elderly ladies were probably about the age I am now, but... Uh, <laughs> She and Sarah were having a conversation, and I just overheard it. They're in line. And this other lady looked at her and said, Sarah, you're, you're smiling. I've never seen you smile before. You have such a beautiful smile. You should put it on more often. End of the conversation. Sarah gets out of line. She goes to the back of the line. She comes through, and by now she's just sobbing. <laughs> and she said, it's gone. The anger and the bitterness is gone. I don't know when it left. But that lady noticed it. And when she said that, I realized I'm free. Amen. She went on her way, and two weeks later, she called me in my office one day, and she said, Pastor, I've got another problem. And I thought, oh, no. We spent six months getting you through the last one. Now what? I didn't say that, but I'm thinking that. What's your problem? She said, I'm a supervisor at my work. I said, I know. And she said, you know that smile? Other people are noticing. Someone thought I got my teeth straightened. Someone else thought I got my teeth whitened or a facelift. I don't know, but they're noticing my smile, and they're asking me, what happened? New boyfriend? New... No. <laughs> she said, Jesus set me free from the anger in my heart. So here's my problem, Pastor. She said, these people are beginning to ask me in private, how can I get Jesus to work in my life? She said, I don't know how to lead someone to Christ. I've got five more minutes on my break. Can you give me a crash course in evangelism? So I, I took her through maybe the Roman road or whatever. She said, thank you. Within a few weeks, guess who was coming to church with her? Some of those co-workers. I tell you, when... When we're free, it shows, and God can use us in ways that are far more effective than he uses us if our hearts are filled with anger and hatred. Number seven, and we'll wrap it up, the plan for reconciliation. Now that I've made things right with God, if possible, and those are two big words, if possible, I must also make things right with the one I've just forgiven. Now, sometimes it's not possible. If your ex has married someone else and they've moved away, it, you know, it may be not a good idea to interrupt their lives again. But whenever possible, and there's a couple of powerful Bible references there you can look up later on your notes, but if possible, go to that person and make things right. Do you know Mabel died without ever making things right with Ruth. Do you think that was a fun funeral to preach? Knowing what I knew, I didn't make that public, but some of the people there knew. A guy came to me one day after teaching on forgiveness, and he said, you know, I've been angry with my father for so long, and he's gone now, and I wish I wish I could roll back time and forgive him. I've got to carry that for the rest of my life. And I said, I'm going to suggest something to you. It may sound weird, but it's really not. I said, sit down in your office or your living room or in your pickup truck or wherever, and just imagine that your father is seated across from you or next to you. And then tell him what's on your heart. Tell him that you forgive him, that you love him. He won't hear it, but at least you'll get it out, out of your system. Or if that person has moved away and it's not possible for you to deal with this, 
write them a letter, put it in an envelope, seal it, pray over it, and then throw it in the fireplace. <laughs> Let it go up in smoke. Be done with it. God wants you to be free. If conflict has set you back, today is your day to come back through forgiveness and reconciliation. Would you stand with me? Father, thank you that most, maybe all of us here this morning, we're all loved by you, and most of us have been forgiven by you because we've asked you. But now you ask that we love and forgive those people in our world that have caused conflict in our lives, those people that have hurt us, offended us in some way. My prayer today, Lord, is that whatever it takes, you would give us the grace, which is already ours, to forgive, to let it go, so that we might be free from that resentment that poisons our hearts. And then whenever possible, maybe this afternoon, to pick up the phone, or maybe it's someone seated here this morning that you say, let's have lunch together. Or an email or a text, whatever it takes, just to say, you know what? I am so sorry for the anger I've had in my heart toward you. Let's make this right so that we can both spend the rest of this Memorial Weekend in peace. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.